There are several specification issues that an analyst must be aware of before they try to perform quadrat analysis. The first issue is around, is around the size of the individual quadrat cells. If the quadrats are too large, one may miss variation that is occurring within the cell. So suppose, for example, this is one quadrat cell out of an entire grid. And inside the cell, we've got points, say, in this corner clustered, and points in this cluster, in that corner clustered. Because all of these points are within this one quadrat cell, all we know about this quadrat cell is the total number of points here. But really, it's, that's going to cover up or gloss over any of the um, actual patterns of how points cluster within a quadrat cell. So for example, if our quadrat cells were um, a quarter of this size, Again, assuming that this is just one part of the study area, at least now inside this study area, inside this quadrat cell, we can see that there, uh, instead of, you know, just having a single count for all of these points, we can see that we've got um, two counts of zero and two counts of a lot of points, this one and this one, and that, you know, is going to probably lead us to believe that, that there's clustering. Uh, whereas before, if we just had one big quadrat cell, uh, it really doesn't allow us to detect that there might be clustering going on inside the quadrat itself. Uh, in terms of cell size selection, well, if you have some sort of rational reason for specifying exactly how big one of these quadrats should be, then go ahead and, and use that. In my experience, um, there really isn't any rationale or some outside theory or some substantive knowledge about the process that's causing the point patterns that would guide us in selecting an appropriate uh, quadrat size. So instead, I like to rely on statistics. Um, you, you might see in some of your readings a recommendation of having 1.6 points per grid cell. I like to be more conservative and say that uh, we should be selecting uh, quadrat sizes such that we have an expected value of five points per quadrat cell. And that, again, that stems from the, uh, the research into chi-squared goodness of fit tests, which tell us uh, to ensure that, that we have five expected observations in each category. The other thing to just keep in mind is that how we place the grid over the point pattern is somewhat arbitrary, and we've seen that in, in earlier lectures. But if, if, you know, if this is our point pattern, well, we can have the, the study area, say, um, capturing the top left of the study area. It could capture the bottom left. It could capture the top right. So also, you know, who says that the grid has to be placed oriented up and down. Maybe it should be oriented on an, an angle like this or on an angle like that. There's really nothing to constrain us here and we just need to recognize that whatever analysis we conduct is going to be somewhat sensitive to how we place the, the study area or how we place the quadrats over the, the study area. Um, something that's quite interesting is the notion of what should we do in places where there is no data. And here I'm using no data in a special way. If you've done any GIS classes, we're talking about no data as areas uh, that really where we can't have points. And um, not just areas where there aren't points, but areas where we can't have points. So imagine you've got a, a study area, like a city like this, and maybe there's like a body of water. Uh, off in the southwest, you know, the lake continues off the map, say. So this is water over here, and then you've got a point distribution. Oh, I shouldn't have chosen that color. Got a point distribution all through here, and you want to know whether or not these points are clustered, and when you you know, drop the quadrats over this, the default setting will be to use quadrats that basically cover the entire study area in a big rectangle. And the issue is that 
these quadrats are going to have zeros all over here. Wherever, wherever the quadrats are over the lake, we're going to have zero counts. And should we include these zeros in our chi-squared statistic, um, the answer is if we do include them, that's, there's going to be, uh, that's going to drive variation. It's going to drive VMR upwards, right? Uh, because you're going to have a lot more zeros there, which is going to be fairly far away from the mean value. It's also going to kind of skew our, our, our mean downwards because we're going to have more grid cells with no points in them, so that's going to bring the mean points per grid cell down. So really having these, these cells here is going to bias our results. And the answer is um, wherever possible, what you want to do is calculate the quadrat uh, s s calculate the the chi square statistic and the VMR ratio by removing all of these uh, no data cells. Okay, so we just exclude these. So if if, if we had m cells, we're going to exclude these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cells from from our analysis altogether. So we're going to bring the total number of cells down by seven.